Hello, welcome to today's video, which is where we're going to be looking at how you can stop getting stung on your next property deal by looking at seven property scams and specifically how to avoid them. Okay, so number one is risks and reward. So if you're looking at property deals that have returns that are far too good to be true, um, that can sometimes be the sign that a property deal or an investment um, is not really all that it seems. So to give you some idea, when we're looking at property deals, there's some general rules of thumb. We try and target buy-to-lets that are around 8% plus rental yields where we can. Now some city centre locations, it's gonna be slightly lower just because of the higher prices of the properties. And you might get buy-to-let yields at around 6% plus for those locations. And if you're really keen on that area and you like that tenant profile, then that can be a good aim to look at. So that's straightforward buy to lets. Now, when we're looking at other types of strategies, we also look at things like HMOs, which is a houses of multiple occupation, and returns for those types of deals can sometimes be around 12% plus gross rental yield. That's what we look for generally across the board. Now, you'll get lower value areas that will give you much higher yields than that, but we wanna try and focus on good quality locations as well. So that's why we target that 12% plus range. If you look at development projects, typically we try and target about 20% return on investment. So around a 20% net return for any development deal. And that's after all costs, all of the refurbishment, the buying and selling fees. At the end of the project, we try and target about 20%. So that gives you some generic rules of thumb to consider. But unfortunately, there are some property scams out there. There are investment scams out there that they give some wildly inflated returns because they try and get people to invest on that basis. So that's why we always say, look at the fundamentals, do your due diligence, look at other things, other aspects than just the returns. So are those deals legitimate? Is there an exit strategy with them? Do the properties make sense compared to local values, whether that's bricks and mortar or yield values if you're buying let's say a ready to go kind of HMO and it's being sold on a more commercial type basis. Um, but just be wary about the sort of figures that you're looking at. If the figures are very inflated, very high compared to other types of deals, then it might be a sign um, that something's not quite right. So that's the first thing to look at is those, re those returns, sorry, that you'll get on those property deals. Okay, so number two is looking at some joint ventures when it comes to property deals. Now I say some because not all joint ventures are bad. We do joint ventures with our properties and clients um, and some partners, friends, families that we've worked with on deals and they've performed very well. And we know customers and clients that are doing it and colleagues as well that are doing it very successfully. But some joint ventures are structured incorrectly from the beginning. So that's very important is trying to understand how the property deal comes together. Um, so don't skip speaking to your accountant. Don't skip speaking to your solicitor. Make sure they're on board to try and understand the best structure of the joint venture for you when you're looking at a particular property deal but just some things to kind of consider when we're doing properties and joint ventures with clients and when we speak to colleagues and how they're structuring them as well very often the client owns the property in their name if they're putting all the funds into that deal so they have 100 percent security over that investment However, there are some companies that do joint ventures with company um, with colleagues, sorry, with clients, and how they structure it is slightly different. So they will typically ask for the client to send them the money. Now that's very dangerous because you then lose control over that particular um, investment. Obviously, the funds go into a bank account that you probably don't have control of. They go to a company that you are not maybe a director or a shareholder of. So again, you don't have any control over that investment. So if you are doing joint ventures, they can be very lucrative, they can be very successful, um, but it's important you structure them right. So speak to your solicitor, speak to your accountant, make sure the structure of that joint venture works for you, um, and ultimately try and structure it so you have control over that property deal if you're putting all of the money into that deal. Um, so buy it under your own name or your company name so you have control of that asset. Okay, so number three is looking at deposits and how you specifically reserve a property when you've seen one that you like if you're buying through a property source or an investment company. 
And the reason why this is important is twofold. One is the amount you're paying as a deposit to reserve that particular property. And two is how that deposit um, is paid, structured, secured, how it goes towards the deal or, or not. Um, now it's not just about how it's done, but it's trying to understand kind of the reasons why it's done. So for example, there are some companies that we've seen set up, fly by night companies that set up and disappear within about a six month time frame. And typically what they do is they charge quite large deposits, reservation fees for customers to reserve a deal that doesn't really exist or that might not be a true property, um, that they're selling on fantastic reels or fantastic location, whatever it might be, that is their selling point. But that property isn't real, it doesn't exist. And the reason why they do this, obviously it's very lucrative for them, they set up and then they disappear after a couple of months. So to get around that, a couple of things to kind of consider. First of all is the amount you're paying in a deposit. If you're just reserving a property, so you're not paying, let's say it's off plan and you're paying stage payments, or you're not doing something called an exchange with delayed completion where you maybe pay 10% or a large amount up front to a prop for a property via solicitors, but you're just reserving a property, you've seen a property you like, you speak to the seller or you speak to their sourcing company and you say you want to buy that particular property, they shouldn't really be charging you high reservation fees. Average reservation fees for the industry are anywhere from about 500 to 1,000 pound. So if you're within that kind of range, you should be there and thereabouts of a figure that makes sense. Anything wildly above that, um, then you want to start to question why those reservation fees are so high and try and understand what it is you're reserving in terms of what stage of the process you're at. As we mentioned, if you're doing an exchange with delayed completion, for example, it's a slightly different process than just a, a simple reservation of a property that you've seen with a company. So that's the first thing to consider. Second thing is how it's secured. So some companies charge that fee directly and you will pay them directly under set terms and conditions. Now that's absolutely fine as long as those terms and conditions outline when you get that deposit back or when that deposit is payable and retained by the company. So for example, if the seller pulls out of the deal, will you get your deposit back? And is that outlined in the terms and conditions? That's a situation that's completely out of your control as a buyer, so you shouldn't be penalized if that happens. So it's important to understand that structure. The other reason why terms and conditions help is to see where that deposit goes. So are you paying it to the company and it stays in their customer account or client account, or are you paying it to a solicitor or to an escrow company? Either of them is fine as long as those terms and conditions outline as we said, the reasons when you might get it back or, or if you don't get it back, the reasons why it goes to the company. So that's important to consider is how you reserve those particular properties. Make sure you deal with companies that are legitimate, have some internet presence ideally that have been around for a long time, that you can check on that company, see, speak to previous customers of theirs maybe, look at previous developments of theirs, so you know that they're an established company and they're not gonna disappear in a couple of months time. And as long as that deposit structure is right, as long as you're paying the right amount, it's not too high, and as long as it's been secured in the right way or it's been paid in the right way with terms and conditions, then you should be protected. Okay, number four is looking at inflated figures. So this isn't the return on investment you might get in terms of rental yields, things like that, and, and general ROI on the deal. It's more about looking at, do those market comparisons make sense for that particular property? Now this happens very often with, certainly overseas stock can be, um, fall into this trap where it's hard to try and understand local valuations. Um, but it does happen with property deals around the UK as well with some companies where you look at the local comparison figures um, and you compare that to the property that you're considering buying um, and the, the figures are, are quite widely different. So it's important to understand the price of the property that it's being kind of marketed at, the price obviously you're paying if that's different or if it's the same, and then what the local comparison properties are on the market for and also selling for. So whether that valuation is close or real, not just for sale prices, but also for rental values. Very often you can see properties that are sold that anticipate a rental um, amount, let's say 600 pound per month, but the actual local market rent is maybe only 500 pound per month. And that's very dangerous when it comes to doing that particular deal. If those rentals aren't, aren't the same, and then you purchase it and go to rent it out and you're receiving a much lower income, um, then that can be very worrying on that particular deal for you because obviously it's gonna affect your income over a period of time and the figures will look a lot different than what you'd originally anticipated. So 
A property scam, unfortunately, that some companies do try is they will inflate the price that they say the market value is for the property or inflate the price that they'll say the potential rental yield is for the property. So it's very important to do your due diligence. Speak to local agents, local letting agents, Understand your own comparisons and properties that are on the market, properties that have sold, properties that have rented and are currently being advertised for rent. Try and get a grasp of those figures. Make sure they're in line with what the property deal is you're looking at um, and you should be okay. You should make sure you're in the right ballpark and looking at the right kind of figures. Okay, so the fifth property scam is unfortunately companies that sell sort of refurbishment type products or properties that require a large scale refurbishment and they do that as a package deal for you. Um, there's some, unfortunately some scams in and around that part of the industry. Now, it doesn't mean that particular strategy or way of buying a property is wrong. It's just important about trying to understand how it should be presented and the type of deals that you should get involved in if you are looking at that. So the issue here is the type of refurbishment that's being done in terms of the amount that you're paying for the refurbishment and when you pay those payments. So some companies charge a upfront fee as like a package deal for the property and they'll say okay well you make a payment for us not just for sourcing the property but also for the refurbishment and the refurbishment could be 40,000 so we want 20,000 or 40,000 on day one and um, again which is very dangerous you shouldn't be in a position where you're paying for a full refurbishment on day one um, on any property that you're considering because it should be staged there's no reason a real reason why you should have to pay all the refurbishment costs up front on day one. That doesn't happen even with new build developments, doesn't happen with conversions um, and even smaller scale refurbishments. If you're doing something that's going to require work on the property, you should be able to make stage payments for it. So if a company is saying that they require all the money up front for the refurbishment, and just be a little bit concerned on that and try and understand why and see if you can make it in stage payments. So for example, how we work with our refurbishment companies is we typically pay on stage payments once per week. So they will do the week's work, we'll then assess it during that time frame. So we usually go on site twice a week, um, once usually either the beginning or the middle of the week to see how things have started off and then once right at the end of the week to sign off that week's worth of work and that's when we'll make payment. It's very important that you pay quickly to make sure you keep the development and refurbishment team on side, um, but stage payments should be the norm within the industry. So certainly look at that if you are looking at refurbishment or conversion type projects. The sixth property scam or investment scam, um, unfortunately, is land. And this is very, um, prominent in times of either recession or growth when people are looking for alternate type of investments and maybe something that's a bit different than the norm. And what you tend to find is a lot of companies, um, well not a lot of companies, but some companies set up and sell land as um, development land or property or land that you could potentially develop at some point in the future. So it's very speculative. So you'd buy now with the ambition that in maybe five or 10 or 15 years, you may get planning on that land. Um, where this sometimes becomes a scam is that they're selling land that's green belt and that really has no potential opportunity or chance to get planning permission on it because it's possibly protected. Um, also land that's being sold at a slightly higher value or certainly sometimes a much more higher value and inflated value without planning permission than what it should be with planning permission. So some companies will sell land and say, okay, well on this land you could build a apartment building or a small housing estate or one, one particular property, depending on the size of the land. And they'll sell it or market it at a rate that's with planning permission. So property or land, sorry, with planning permission is valued differently than land without planning permission because sometimes that planning permission can be hard to get so there's much more value in having that planning permission. So if you are looking at land deals, make sure you understand the cost per acre or hectare, whatever type of land it is you're looking at buying and really analyze that and see if it's potential really to get the plans that you want to do on that site and what it will be worth with planning permission and then if that investment is worth it. Um, it's very often easier to look at land with planning permission in place and then you cut out a lot of the risk that might be associated with that. But if land is your thing, if you want to start looking at land development sites, um, be, just be aware of the different values essentially of what land should be with planning permission, what land should be kind of without planning permission in and around that local area and also what the potential likelihood is of getting planning permission um, for that particular location. 
And last up on the property and investment scams is something that's more recent actually that we've been kind of speaking to our solicitor about is phishing of bank details. Now this might sound a bit strange in, in relation to property, but what you'll find obviously in normal kind of uh, say normal scams that you might get on email, people looking to try and kind of pinch bank details, that type of stuff. Specifically in property, what's happened in a couple of transactions recently is that fraudsters have hacked into solicitors um, emails and then sent an email from or, or cloned an email from that particular solicitor to potentially clients and sent out and say if you're looking to maybe buy a property at that point in time you'd usually send money to your solicitor to, to buy the property so you will make a wire transfer from your account to the solicitor's account to allow that purchase to happen that's completely normal but what the fraudsters will do is they'll hack that send an email through to the client and say um, sorry there's been a change of bank details can you send it through to this account instead the client then sends all the purchase money um, to a bank account that doesn't exist or sorry doesn't it's not the solicitor's account it's the fraudsters account and then they lose all of that money so that's something that's more recent it's not wildly prominent as in it's something that you shouldn't be worried about it to the extent that you don't do property deals but it's something you should really have a conversation with with your solicitor and just before you make a bank transaction speak to your solicitor about it over the phone rather than just relying on email that way you should try and overcome those particular issues that some buyers are experiencing at the moment where they might get a phishing issue from a fraudster saying like here's new bank details and then that money goes disappearing so obviously that's a, a very big cost if that happens it's a lot of money to kind of lose on a transaction so all I'd say for that is just make sure you speak to your solicitor make sure you have a conversation with them and see what their protocol is in place um, again to make sure that shouldn't happen um, and then you should be absolutely fine so hopefully those seven tips have give you some kind of guidance a little bit of um, understanding and knowledge of what to look for when you're considering your next property deal um, any questions on this particular video uh, feel free to ask in the comments below more than happy to help um, and look forward to catching up with you soon. Take care. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content and you'd like to join our free online property training course, we've got a link for it on this page. And in there, we cover a range of different property strategies to help you get started, either building a long term property portfolio or creating a cash flowing property business. We also look at ways to increase your return on investment with any of the property books you're maybe considering. And we also have a couple of cheat sheets and downloadable documents in there as well. Simply click on the link to join the free training course today.